Hey everybody, um, <laughs> wait a minute, what are you doing? <laughs> another sit down. I don't, I don't remember what I'm doing. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. Everything is great on this end. And today I got a special guy that I'm going to sit down with. We've done it before. He's come back again. I was lucky enough to capture him. He came out to LA, grabbed him right away, said, Chaz, you got to be on the podcast again because everybody loved you last time. So this time it's going to be just as good. Chaz Palminteri coming up. Don't move. Offer you can't refuse. And I'm going to tell you this. He has his own podcast. It's good or better than mine, you know, because he's smarter than me. So go out and look at it. I mean that. But anyway, Chaz Palminteri coming up. Stay tuned. Chaz, this is a, a great surprise. I didn't know you were going to be here, but yeah. I captured you, got you into the studio. Yes. And uh, we had such a great time uh, first time around. I got to right. tell you this. I've sat down with so many people, but I don't know if you realize this. The last time that we were together, so many people took just little tidbits of words yeah. that you said and it spread like wildfire. Some of them went viral. Yes, I saw that. They yeah. really went viral. And uh it was just great. We got such great comments. People love the dialogue between us. So it's great to have you back. You and I have become friends. Yes. I just want everybody to know uh, I ate in Chaz's restaurant in Manhattan. It was terrific. We had a great time. Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. And, uh, and obviously you treated us uh, very well. So well, it was, it was well, no, it was my pleasure. So many people have told me, you got to do things with Michael Francis. You, we loved it. You know, I says, yeah. I says, you know, when I go back out to L.A. And so that's why when I called you, I said, I'm coming out to L.A. And and then you said, I want to do your podcast. And I said, oh, well, well, well that'll be great. I mentioned to you yesterday, like my son has, and, my, and my daughter, I was already famous when they were born. Mm -hmm. So and when they grow older, you know, my, they know De Niro, Pacino, Robin Williams, Brad Pitt. They know them all. When I said to Dante, I said, yeah, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do a podcast. He says, what are you doing a podcast with? I said, you know, Michael Francis. No way, I'm going. I mean, freaking out, freaking out. And his girlfriend, Chloe, said, you're going to go there? Can I come too? I said, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, freaking out to meet you. You know, when you said that, I thought you were going to say, you know, and he's so level-headed, he doesn't make any of these things get to him. But when you said that, I was, wow. No, no, I'm serious. I love your son, by the way. Just love him. No, he's... <laughs> He's a good boy. We try to do the right thing. Absolutely. Bring them up yes. the right way. I said, gee, that's a subject I wanted to talk to you about. Do you think the wise guys from the old days, like the 20s, I mean, even the Black Hand uh, in the early 1890s, and then coming with Lucky Luciano, you think they were always admired by people? or It was like a double-edged sword. People admire them, but they didn't want to be with them. You know, they want to, be, they want to have their ear but they don't want to be involved. I used to think it was like the cowboys, you know, like the big gunslingers. You want to be friends with Jesse James, but you don't want him to be over your house for dinner. What is it with wise guys that people just love? I don't know. It's a good point. And I think there's a lot of validity to what you said. A lot of people, they want to admire you from a distance. Right. But, you know, that take that next step and be really involved with you. What does that mean? You know, right. what's it going to do to me? And then there were other guys, Chaz, that just dying to be around us. You know, they just, for some reason, maybe they want a piece of what they perceive as power. Or, right. You know, right. who knows what it is. But I'll tell you this, you know, I'll, I'll never forget. When the movie The Godfather came out right. back in the 70s, that movie did more for my, my former life than anything before it because it, it gave a certain amount of dignity and class to that life. Right. I think the way the actors carried themselves, right. the way the story was written. Guys on the street actually started to, to talk differently. They started to act differently. They would even dress differently. I mean, I noticed this. And it was all because of The Godfather. That's the kind of impact that that movie had on guys wow. on the street. 
you know, I was young then, so I mean, right. I was just coming up. I was just starting, but I noticed it. And even, you know, I had a conversation with my dad, and he once said, you believe these guys, they all think they're part of the Godfather now. That's what he would talk. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I've mentioned this to you a couple of times, that what the Godfather did, it was like insane. I would go into a nightclub, I had to kiss 12, 12 guys. <laughs> yes. Before I even sat down, I had to kiss 12 guys. You know, and meanwhile, there were times, we did kiss before that, but oh my God, it was yes. like guys that even guys that didn't even know. Hey, 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 Chaz. Hey, I used to go. Oh, oh God, I don't want to go in there. I got to kiss too many people. You know. Yeah. Well, the great thing about COVID was once COVID came, it stopped everything. <laughs> it stopped. Yeah. So I love that. It's amazing how people are just enamored by, by real wise guys. I mean, I'm sure wise guys know that, right? Yes. I mean, there's no question. And you know, look. There's a different, and I, I hate to say it because I don't want to be like offensive to anybody, but there's a different class of wise guys, even among all of us. There were guys that carried themselves a certain way. And look, you got to, the most notable would be John Gotti. He was the guy that, you know, really personified that whole era right. because of all the publicity that he had. But he dressed the part, he looked the part, he acted the part in some way. So there was a certain dignity about guys like him. Maybe Joe Colombo, you got to say the same thing. He tried right. to carry himself a different way. And then the, the guys that are just thugs on the street, you know, yeah. so there was like two levels, two different levels. Right. And the guys that carried themselves the right way, people wanted to be around. I'll be honest with you, Chaz, I never had to chase anybody. I mean, people were always chasing me, maybe because of my dad, and, you know, I'll admit to that, and you know, he yeah. had a big name, and then when I started to come up and people around me started to see the way I was acting, they wanted to be around us. You know, there was just certain thing that they wanted to be around, and... Uh, right, now do you feel, Michael, do you feel that they had laws in the wise guys? I, I remember, you know, I'm Sicilian, so I know the old country, they had laws where they would never hurt your family. Right. right? But is it still that way now or it's not that way anymore? To my knowledge, it's never been violated. We were told straight out, you know, you don't ever bother a guy's wife, daughter, sister, mother. You right. don't mess with family. Unless the family itself was involved, one of your family members, that's different. But if your family members weren't involved, like, look, when I walked away from that life, I never worried about anybody retaliating against my family. I never saw that happen. I don't think we, we, we had a certain respect in that regard. And to my knowledge, that wasn't violated. Right. So I never worried about that because people that didn't know any better said, why aren't you worried about your family? You know, I said, no, why? You know, nobody's going to retaliate against them. We don't do that. Right. And, right. Uh, and I don't think it's changed now. I mean, I but, haven't heard it. But anything. wasn't it that even if a guy tried to like, you know, fool around with your wife or try to come out to your wife, that was bad too, right? You're told straight out, you mess with somebody else's wife, daughter, sister, mother, you're dead. That's it. That's dead. Dead. I'll tell you a story. It's a sad story. There was a guy, he was a made guy that was in our crew. And uh, he was around a long time. Him and his brother were made. And his father was made before him. One day we're driving in Brooklyn and I'm driving him to his house, driving him home. So he gets out of the car and he says, Michael, wait, before you leave, I want to make sure that somebody's home. I said, okay. I thought maybe he didn't have a key. So he opens the door, he goes in for a second, he's standing by the door, I see him calling to somebody, and then he shuts the door and comes back. And I said, what happened? You went in, he said, but nobody's home. I said, but you went in the house, what are, what are you worried about? He said, I can't go in my house. I said, why not? He said, because I'm haunted. I said, what do you mean you're haunted? His father had messed around, who was a maid guy, had messed around with somebody else's wife or daughter, I forget who it was, and the two brothers killed him. And from that moment on, he said, I can never be in my house alone. He said, I'm haunted by it. And I'm saying to myself, he killed his own father. So that's how serious that was. Wow. That's how serious that was. <sighs> you, don't, you don't cross that line. You don't cross that line, no. yeah. No. Well, I mean, I think that's right. But when it came to scheming money, they do anything. To... <laughs> that, well, was, <laughs> that was a total <laughs> different thing. You could probably rob somebody's wife, but just don't mess with her. No, I'm only kidding. No, no. no, no I'm saying it's pretty amazing. I, you know, I always found that to be incredible, you know. It's, but that's what made Wise Guys fascinating. I tell people all the time, you know, we're in a generation now where they're trying to get rid of things that aren't socially acceptable now. Right. They haven't done that with the mafia yet, of course, in Austria in this country, but it's, it was a major part of American history. Right. I mean, the mob in this country for over 100 years survived and prospered under some very difficult conditions. Right. And it was actually a part of our culture. I mean, right. think about it. 
You know, and we infiltrated every fabric of society from the guy on the street in the numbers business right, right up to the White House. I and mean, we had, you know, relationships that brought us into the White House. So it was a major, and we control the unions. You, can, you know this, Chaz, you control the unions in this country. You control, you control the country. You control the country. You have politicians doing your bidding. You had everybody, you know, at, at your, uh, right. your behest. And so it was a major part of our culture. Right. And I think back in the 80s when Giuliani started to use the racketeering laws yes. effectively, I think he was the first guy that started to realize, hey, we got to get rid of these guys. Well, Rico was the thing that just... Devastated. Once Rico came in, that was it. Devastating. It devastated everybody. Very hard to defend. Uh, right, you can't. And it was some professor came up with that. I forgot who it was, but he came up with that. And they said, yeah, yeah. Yes. His name was DeBakey. Well, it was like, you know, the chin. You know, yeah. the, you couldn't get the chin because he, he didn't have a phone. That's right. He wouldn't talk to anybody in public, and he, he would whisper. So they never had him on tape. Right. I mean, literally, if you don't talk on tape, it's very hard to get you. Very difficult. Another quick story. I'm on trial. Giuliani puts me on trial. I'm on trial for seven months. I had 15 co-defendants. I was a lead defendant, right? Right. There was one guy, Chaz, I'll never forget. He was a union guy. I never met him. I never met half the guys that I was on trial with. Right. I didn't even know who they were. And, but they throw you all together in his RICO indictments. So they mention his name in the opening statement. He was a union guy once. Yeah. We go through six, seven months. They never mention his name again, right? He was a nice guy. So I go up to him when, when we're ready to wrap up and go to, I say, hey, you're going home. They never even mentioned it. They forgot about you. Don't right. worry about it, right? Last day before they uh, uh, do closing arguments, they play one tape of his, right? And on the tape, he's sitting in the conference room of this place, and he, said, he makes this statement. I, I'll never forget. He said, listen, what we're doing here is a crime. If this tape, table is bugged, we're all going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he said. He gets convicted. He gets seven years based upon That's all that. he said. That's all he said. His words, though. <laughs> it's a crime. If this place is bugged, we're all going to jail. And that was it. He, he got said, seven years, a poor guy. <laughs> that's why you cannot talk on the thing. I get asked this question a lot, Michael. People always go, Chaz, we know you know these things. They said, what is it? When it for a guy to get a button, for a guy to be made, does he have to kill somebody or does he have to be an earner? Years ago it was he had to whack somebody when I was a kid. Was it always that way or did it change as it, as it you know? It's never changed. Look, um, you have to be ready to right. do whatever you're told to do. Right. And uh, look, I mean, I, I don't like to talk about it, but I'll say I've been honest about this. You know, when my father first proposed me, we right. were sitting in Leavenworth in the, uh, in the visiting room, and he said to me, he said, I'm going to ask you one question. I want an honest answer. I said, go ahead, Dad. He said, if you ever had to kill somebody, could you do it? Never asked that question before. And I thought about it a minute. I said, Dad, under the right circumstances, I think I can. He said, that's the right answer. And that's when he proposed me. He said, go home, somebody will be in touch with you, do whatever you're told. Now, at the time that I was made, there was, I don't know if you remember, the, the, there was an expression that the books were closed. The books were they closed. They weren't bringing any new that's guys That's right, they in. didn't open the books for a while. For a while, from the 50s right through 1975. Right, exactly. And so there was tons of guys waiting to be made that were proposed. Right. They were waiting 10, 15, 20 years, right. right? So now they bring all of these guys in, and I don't mean to be offensive, but how many guys are you going to kill? They don't just tell a guy, hey, go out and kill anybody you want. You <laughs> exactly. Know? exactly. So, so guys were, were brought into that life, but they were told, your day is going to come. You're going to be called on. You've got to be ready to do it. So there was guys that were made without necessarily pulling a trigger at that point, but when, they, when the time came... So that makes sense. So, of course, the books were closed for so long that when they opened them, they had so many guys that... How many guys you want to kill? you gotta, you got to make somebody. Exactly. Now, did they close the books because of the Appalachian thing? Yeah, they said it was security reasons because they were bringing too, guy, too many guys in, law enforcement supposedly right. getting sophisticated. So all the families said the only time you can bring a guy in is to replace a guy that died. Right. In the family. That's it. You know, but that was the commission ruling. But I, I got to tell you, you know, they talk a lot about the commission. Right. But I, I compare the commission to the United Nations. Right. It had a big voice, allegedly, and a big title, but it didn't do anything. 
in many, many ways because right. the commission can never tell the boss of a family what to do with his own family. They could advise, they can suggest, right. but one boss can't tell another boss what to do in his own family. So the commission, it didn't have as much weight as people think it, that it did. Wow. And I've heard, you know, my boss tell me, hey, I don't care what they think. I do what I want in my own family. And I heard that many times. Right. But what about four bosses came to you and said, look, you, this has got to change. That's something else. Then. Yeah. I mean, most of the time they'll try to agree with one another. Right. And, you know, but look, it's a street life. People still do shady things, you know, even. They if, don't <laughs> listen, right? No. They don't listen. You know, I always meant to ask you, Carmine the Persico? Snake. Carmine Persico. Carmine yeah. Persico. Was the snake a name that he liked or he didn't like that? He hated it. He hated it. How did he get that name? Because during the uh, Profaci Gallo War, yeah. he was originally with uh, the Gallows. Yes. And then he turned on them. Oh. And from that point on, they called him the snake. And he went with the side that was going to win, Profaci's side, Colombo eventually. But uh, so from that point on, he got That's that. That's why he got the name. Yes. And we hated it. Nobody, it's just like Fat Tony. Nobody would call him Fat Nobody Tony. Nobody would call him to his face, no, Fat Tony, no. right? A lot of people had a lot of things to say. I got along well with Junior. I, I liked him. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I think he liked me. Like, he respected my dad. Um, I got along well with him. But, you know, a lot of guys had different opinions. But, I mean, the guy never had a chance to be a good boss. He was always in jail. You come home for six months, they lock him up again. I mean, he was like my dad, in and out, in and out. Yeah. So you got to give him credit because he, he ran the family for a long time while in prison because he, he had the right people around him. Michael, it always fascinated me. How could a guy who's in jail and he's doing 20 years, why don't the guys who are, you know, in the family go, hey, you know what, fuck him. Uh, he's in jail. Let's, let's get a new boss. How come they don't do that? Well, they do. And that's when, uh, when Vic Arena, when we had our last war, we were always at war. Right. In the 90s, Vic Arena, you know, made that move. And that's when the family went to war again. But the, ra the way Junior was able to hold on is because he had a lot of his family. He had his son, Ali Boy. Oh, okay. He had Andrew Russo, who was his first cousin. Yeah. You know, so you couldn't he put, turn all those people. No, you couldn't turn. Right. They were loyal to him. Right, they were loyal, loyal to him. him. Okay, but it, it's hard for him in jail. I mean, there's no, you know, people think it's it's so easy to. It's it's not. Communication is hard, especially when you're in the federal system, because they watch for that and they separate you and they they make it hard for you to to run things on the outside. They really do. Wow, it always fascinated me. And, and look, I mean, jail. I mean, you did a couple of years in the hole, right? I did uh, 29 months and seven days in the hole. 29 months and so almost. Almost three years. Almost three years in the hole. I'll be honest with you, Chaz. You know, people can say, eh, you know, put me in a hole. It, that's tough. I mean, you know, I learned through that experience we weren't meant to be solo creatures. We were meant to be social. Right. There's no doubt. A lot, of, a lot of guys, when those lights went out at night, you heard a lot of moaning and groaning. And uh, it, it's tough. It's tough being in solitary. Yeah, I mean, I remember when we shot, analyzed this, De Niro said, oh, I got to have real criminals, you know. So we like, oh, okay, Bob. <laughs> you know, Bob is so meticulous. And we went up to Sing Sing, and we sat down with these guys, and I was talking to one of the cops, one of the bosses of the cops, and he was saying to me, oh, goes, oh, yeah. He goes, we can have a day where four or five suicides right in a row. Five days in a row, he said. Yeah. Five days in a row, five people kill themselves. People, do they, they lose their minds. They lose their mind. You know, we used to get one or two showers a week. And when they shower you, they handcuff you. Because when you're in a hole, they got to shackle you whenever you move anywhere. If you go to the yard, the yard is a cage. So you got to you in a cage. Got to be shackled, right? And uh, when they put you in a shower, they lock the shower. And sometimes there's a disturbance upstairs where they call all the, the cops right. upstairs. You're in the shower five or six hours, seven hours, until they come back down and take you out. And sometimes the shower goes off because they don't let you run the water that whole time. And you just sit, you're in there for five, six hours. You may as well sit on the floor until they come back. I mean, it's, it's a crazy situation. I got ptomaine poison four or five times in there to, to the point where I would only eat uh, packaged goods that I bought in a commissary. I ate like a cup of soup. I would eat cereal and that's it. That's it. I wouldn't need anything else. The amazing, and my son and I were just talking about because my son and I, we work out a lot. How do these guys, there's no, now they've taken weights away in California from guys. 
there's not really a, a great gym there. How do these guys get so jacked up? The food is shit. How does that happen? Well, during my day when they had, you know, gyms in there and then they took them away because right. they said they were making super criminals. Some politician gets on there and says, we have to take all the wastes out of the out of the yard, prison yards, because they're making super criminals. Nonsense. Not, it's nonsense. It's the dumbest thing you ever heard. It's, it's the best thing for them, so at least they keep their mind over. Do you know what? All the wardens in the Bureau of Prisons revolted against it. They said, hey, this is the one place these guys go in there, they knock themselves out, they get tired, they go to sleep. Yeah. What, what else are they going to do when they're on the yard? They did it anyway. What, what they did is, the wardens, just to diverse, the, the wardens fought back, and they said, okay, we won't take the uh, weights out, but you can't build them in any new prisons, and you can't replace them. If they're broke, they got to go. So they would never, you know, be able to replace them. It was stupid stuff. But, uh, you know, a lot of guys worked out in there and did what they can. And then when you get in the hole, I mean, I don't care. There's nothing you can do but push-ups and sit-ups. That's it. Wow. Yeah, there's nothing in there. On my podcast, I have this... Uh... I'm starting this kind of like moment where defining moments, and I, I and you're going to be my first defining moment. Okay. So I would say in the next few weeks I'm interviewing these people, and I would like to know from you, Michael Francis, what was your defining moment in your life that brought you here today? Everybody has a defining moment. So sometimes you have two of them, three of them. But if you had to pick one, what do you think it would be? Well, let me, let me say this first, because I had more than one. Right. But uh, on your podcast, I have so many people saying to me, since we have done our last one, yeah. Jazz has got so many words of wisdom. With every guest that he has, there's some good, encouraging information that comes out of it. So uh, I'm actually advising my whole inner circle to subscribe to your podcast oh, and to listen you. because it's just great stuff. Thanks. You know, it's, it's not only about storytelling, but people need to hear good things. Good, and, yes. And you're providing a lot of that. So, oh, thank you. Thank uh, and you. I, I know you're going to grow. You're growing big already. It's coming. But, thank you. Thanks a lot. But, you know, I'll I tell you one defining moment that really changed the course of my life. When my dad, I had seen my dad get arrested my whole life since from the time I was a kid. So it didn't mean that much. But this time... Well, I shouldn't say it didn't mean that much, but I know he got, he went in, he got out, he went right. in, he got out. But this particular time, he gets uh, convicted of conspiracy to rob banks. He gets sentenced to 50 years in prison. 50? 50. 50. It was the longest sentence for a bank robbery conspiracy. He was supposed to have masterminded, ordered it, that was ever given up to that point, right? From what I'm told. They didn't rob the bank. No, he allegedly had one meeting... <laughs> And told everybody to go rob banks. And he got convicted of masterminding wow. and got 50 years. He got 225s running wild back to back. Back to back, yeah. He was out on appeal for three years. Back then, you were allowed to stay out on appeal. Right. He loses all his appeals. In 1970, they lock, they lock him up. He goes into MDC, uh, the, uh, the jail in New York, federal jail. Right. So I go see him. And it was my first discussion with him. I said, Dad, bank robbery? And he looked at me, and I'll never forget, he said, look me in my eyes. I said, okay. He said, I am no bank robber. I was framed. I didn't commit this crime, Michael. And I believed him. Because to that point, I don't think my dad ever lied to me. Yeah. And he said, and I need your help. He said, you got to take care of your mother, your brothers and sisters, because I was like 18, 19. And he said, somehow we got to overturn this conviction. We got we to gotta beat this case. He said, well, I'm gonna, I got a death sentence. And, um, and that's when we had this discussion about, you know, me being on the street and all this kind of stuff. And that was, that's when I made up my mind that no matter what I had to do, I was going to help my father get out of jail. And that's what led me into the mob. Because prior to that, I, you know, I loved my dad. I respected him. He was my hero. But I didn't want to be a mobster. If you would ask me back then what I wanted to be, I wanted to play center field for the New York Yankees. Right, Mickey right. Mantle was my hero back then, you know. <laughs> right. And uh, I was a college kid. I was going to be a pre-med student. But yeah. that, that changed my whole trajectory in life because I said, I can't let my dad die in prison. You know, when he said, if you're going to be on the street, I want you to be on the street the right way. This is the way you can help me. And he proposed me. And I said, Dad, whatever you want me to do, just point me in that direction. So that was a defining moment. Changed my whole course of life. Wow. My next defining moment was when I met my wife. And after I had gone through everything, I'm in that life, you know, all those years. I had, I think, I don't know, six indictments. I went to trial five times. In the mid-80s, when the racketeering laws came in, Chaz, I'm telling you, I'm in jail 
They locked me up with no bail on a one racketeering case. I'm in jail with everybody, all the guys, right? And they're all going to trial, and they're getting convicted, and they're coming back in 80 years, 100 years, 200 years. One guy got 300 years, I'll never forget. And I'm looking, I'm saying, I'm the youngest guy at all of these guys. They're gonna put me away for a half a, uh, yeah. uh, you know, a billion years. I said, this life is in trouble. And then I'm, I'm talking to this guy, Willie Boy, Willie Boy Johnson. Willie Boy Johnson. Willie Boy yeah, Johnson. Yeah, yeah, I know him. He was yeah. with Gotti. He was, yeah, he was right under Gotti. He, he wasn't was, a full Italian. No, he was Irish. He, he was Irish. Yeah, he was Irish. Yeah, right. I had been Shylocking with him. He was a good, nice guy. So yeah. he came to me for money. I said, John, is it all right? He said, yeah, all right, don't worry about it. So I was, he was putting money out on the street. Right. So I'm saying, my God, this guy's an informant for 20-something years. And then I hear Greg Scarpa, 20, 30 years. I said, who can we trust anymore? <laughs> you know? Right. You know, so I said, this life is over. That's when I decided I, I got to make a break. I, to I get out of the life. To, try to get out of the life. Yeah. And then, you know, I met my wife, um, and that was it. I said, oh, I'm going to marry, I fell in love with this girl. I'm going to marry her. What am I going to do, go away for 100 years after that? She yeah. was 20 years old. Exactly. So I said, I got to make a choice. And um, that's when I decided to walk away. So the defining moment. There's a few of them. What was yeah. a few, right. Yeah, with those two. and Because they were life-changing for me. Because I'll tell you right now, Chaz, if I don't walk away, I'm either dead or in prison for the rest by of my now. life. By now, yeah, by now. Without a doubt. No doubt. Wow, yeah, probably. Uh, without a doubt. That war we had, in, uh, I think 13 guys got killed yeah. in the early 90s. I think uh, something like 28 yeah. guys went to jail for yeah. life. Another 15 became informants. I mean, it was a mess. How are you going to survive that? I always wanted to ask you, why did they call Scarpo the Grim Reaper? <laughs> that was his personality. And, uh, you know, look, I mean, he, he was a rough guy. He was a killer. He no was. Doubt. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was a serial killer. You know, him, uh, you know, a couple of the guys, I mean, it just... Like the, the Mayo crew, they were serial killers. The Mayo. Serial, they were serial killer. killers. Serial killer. I mean, no, they would kill no guys conscience. for no reason. No conscience. I heard they used to, like, <laughs> they used to actually be playing cards, eating lasagna, and three guys would be hanging in the bathroom, bleeding. Yeah, you know, in the Gemini Club. They, the Gemini Club, they would drain their bodies, drain the blood out of their bodies. And then they go back to eating and, like, you know. You know, the problem is that people identify... Cosa Nostra with a Greg Scarpa or with, uh, with that guy, DeMeo, Roy DeMeo. Right. Yeah. Chaz, it wasn't like that. You know, there's, there's guys now on the internet that if you listen to them, you think every day we're, we're beating somebody up or right. killing somebody. It wasn't like that. I mean, you know, there was a lot of us that we didn't have to do that. People understood who we were, our presence meant something, right. and we didn't have to act that way. It's not that we couldn't, but... Why do you want to do that if you don't have to? Right. And my father taught me that too. Look, my father was a tough guy. There was no question. I mean, he's, if, you had to, if you had to epitomize somebody as being a tough guy in that life, it was my dad. It was your dad. Yeah. I mean, your dad is known to be the guy. Like, he if was. you had to put a, in a dictionary, that's the guy. Because he, was he the guy. always did, yeah, always did right. He was a guy. But he also taught me, he says, Michael, that's the last resort. You don't want to have to do that. You know, he says, make your presence be, you know, as I used to, I, I used to have clubs, right, that I was associated with in Long Island and Brooklyn. And I would get bouncers and I'd get the big guys that look strong, right? And I'd tell them, hey, you look like this for one reason. If you got to go in there and start beating somebody up every night, what do I need you for? I right. can get small guys to do that too. Right. I said, your presence is supposed to be enough to show people that they can't mess around in here. And in a way... The way we carried ourselves, people knew who we were. That should be enough most of the time. Right. But, you know, some guys just did it differently. Did you ever have an incident, I've always wanted to ask you this, Michael, where nobody, they didn't know who you were, and they acted a certain way towards you, then they found out who you were, and then it was a whole big difference? <laughs> I'll give you, a, I'm in a San Suzanne, which was my dad's club one. That happened many times. I'm in a San yeah. Suzanne. My dad had a piece of that club. And, uh, and then I got involved and took it over. And some guy is at the bar, and he's not behaving himself. He's being silly with the bartender, the, the, the waitress, rather. Right. He's behind the bar, what do you call it? Joe Black comes over to me, and he says, Michael, you want to talk to this guy? He's, he's acting silly. He's bothering people at the bar. So I go up to him, and I said, look, you know, why don't you behave yourself? I said, people are getting a noise, a nice place here. He looks at me, he says, you know who I am? Chess, I hate that line. Do you I hate, hate that, that line? line? I hate that I line hate more that than anything. Line more than anything. Right. I said, no, no, who, tell me who you are. He said, you know who owns this place? 
I said, no, tell me who owns your place. He said, did you ever hear Sonny Francis? I said, I heard of him. He said, you know, Sonny's in prison. I said, yeah, I know that. He said, I make one phone call to his son and he'll be down here in five minutes. <laughs> this is what he tells me, right? I said, really? I said, well, I got a surprise for you. I said, he's going to be here quicker than that. <laughs> Now, I will tell you, I was just a little bit thuggish at that point in time right. because I hated that. That's why my father went to jail. People using <laughs> his name and doing all of this stuff. They use it, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, and I had, you know, incidents similar to that where people act one way and then, oh, my God. I mean, I was, people don't realize, but we know that because, uh, again, you were in the life, but I was around the life, that you don't use somebody's name if you really don't know him. Or, or if he doesn't know that you can use his name, you just don't do that. That's a bad thing to do. You don't drop names. You don't drop names, man. I hate that. I hate when people do. You know who I am. I, you know, I mean, come on. Anybody who says you know who I am, it's an asshole. I mean, I'm, I, I just, you just don't do that. Do you know who I am? I don't know who you are. If you were somebody, I would know who That's you right. are. That's what I always That's say. Right. I don't know who you are. That's right. You know, Chad, I got to say this. Now that you bring it up, you grew up. Around the street and around a lot of guys. Right. And I'm sure you had the opportunity to do certain things and maybe become involved in the life yeah. in some way. And I'm sure people, I don't want to say tried to put the arm on you, but maybe tried to romance you and, yeah. and, and maybe get involved. And, and I got to give you credit because you didn't. No. You know, you made your way your way. You did it the right way. You did it your own way. And I have a lot of respect for that. I mean, you know, what I think it is, Michael, thank you. And I, what I think it is, if you have a dream... And you, you have a, this vision of who you want to be. I always wanted to be an actor and a, and a writer. And I, and I had that vision, and I just didn't sway away from it, you know. And, and I think that's what keeps a, a person there, is if you have something to look forward to, something that, a passion that you get up in the morning and you say, I want to do this, man. I want to do this. Where my friends, some of them, not all of them, some of, them, my, other, my, some of my other friends are very successful. But some of my other friends, they didn't have a passion. It was like, to them it was, I wake up in the morning, how could I get money? How could I scheme somebody something? How could I scam somebody? Well, I would wake up in the morning and we we were scamming in card games and things like that. But in, my, in the back of my mind, I said, well, I, you know, I want to go to school. I want to stay in school. Did I get tempted? Yes. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I did. But I just, I wanted to be somebody. I let wanted me, to do something with my life. Let me ask you this, because I know a lot of guys in your position would have been enamored or attracted to guys in their life. What, what was it that allowed you or made you keep your distance? Yeah. Oh, I was enamored by them. Oh, yeah. And I was friends with some of the, some of the real guys. And I would say, and I won't have to say anything, but, you know, I said, yeah, yeah. Or, you know how it is. If, you, if you're friends with the President of the United States and you go somewhere... You know, you're sitting next to him. Everybody's looking at you. It's, it's intoxicating, man. It, it is intoxicating. Or if one of the bosses said to me, hey, come here. He's a good kid, this kid. Ah, come here, you fuck. You know, come yes. here. I love this kid. You mess with this kid, you mess with me. They would kid around with things like that. And it felt great. Mm -hmm. But you know what? When the time came after I got nominated for an Academy Award and, and they put the screws on me, which I didn't think was going to come. Mm -hmm. I thought that would never happen, but I was at the bar, and I went back just as right after I got nominated, and a guy walked over to me, and he said, uh, hey, so-and-so wants, wants to talk to you. They're, you know, they're in the back. Now, when a guy says that, you know it's bad news. Right. It's bad news. Absolutely. I don't care what it is. It's not good news. Absolutely. So-and-so <laughs> wants to talk yeah, right. to you. He's in the back. So in my mind, I'm already saying to myself, okay, I'm walking, I'll never forget it, I think I, I told you the story. I'm walking towards the back room, and I see them all around a round table with a black, a white and red tablecloth. I could see it now. And I'm saying to myself, they're going to hit on me, and there's no, excuse me, there's no fucking way that I'm going to give these guys anything. And I said it to myself. I said, Chaz, just be cool. You know how to do this. I said, but if it comes down to and on my mother and father, I should die right now if I'm lying. I said, I will take a fucking bullet to the head before I give them a piece of me right now. And I walked over to them and I sat down. And they started, they were, said they were really proud of me getting nominated. And then they said, we have a friend of ours in L.A. 
who you know, and said that he, you could be with him, and he'll make phone calls for you, and you'll be with him. And, and I said, you know what, all due respect, I appreciate it. Thank you for thinking of me. I, I, I'm glad you're looking out for a guy from the neighborhood. I said, but at this stage of my career, I don't need anybody to make a phone call for me. But I appreciate all your help, and I will never forget it. And one of them said to me, I'll never forget his words, he said, oh, you're a big star now, you don't need us. I said, no, 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 not at all. I said, I'm no star, I'm just an actor, what am I? I said, you, you guys are the stars, let's be honest. I said, but I really appreciate you thinking of me. And right there, I stood up, I got up from the table, because once you get up, the meeting's over. Mm -hmm. I stood up and said, hey guys, I gotta run, thank you so much, and I was shaking and hugging a few of them. And one of them said, hey, come outside and uh, I'll put my arm around you, you can take a picture with the FBI. I said, no, 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 I'm not. Uh, so they all looked at me, they said, you sure? You don't? I said, no, no, no. I said, well, if you change your mind, you let us know. I said, yeah, okay. I never went back to that bar again, ever. That's the one bar I never went back to in my neighborhood. And that was it. But I, I was ready, I, I was ready. I can't believe I'm saying this, I was ready to die. That was your defining moment. That's a big defining moment. Uh, because your whole life moment. would have changed. My whole life would have changed. Because they would have had a piece of me and a piece of my, my, my wonderful work of Bronx Tale in the one-man show, in the musical, in the movie. And I can tell you this. Yeah. We're like the government in that regard. Once we get a piece, we don't give it back. You don't give it back, right. Oh, you got it forever. I mean, right. We got that piece forever. You got that piece. And so it, that it, was a defining that moment. That was a defining moment. I'll never forget it. I said, I will take a bullet in the brain, right now, I was ready. And if they would have said, no, you're doing this, I would have said, no, you're not, I'm not, I'm not. You could do whatever you gotta do, do what you gotta do, but I'm not doing it. There's no way I would have did it, because I saw what it does. It was the best move, you know, I without saw. a doubt. And my father always used to tell me, once they get their hooks in you, it's over. They never, he goes, you could say no in the beginning, my dad told me. And, and another wise guy told me that. He goes, you could say no in the beginning and you could threaten to go to the law and you might get away with it. He says, but once you say yes, yes. you can't say no. That's right. And they didn't bother you after that. Right? Never bothered me again. And, and you know what? If guys stood up like that, people think that the next movies are going to come and put a gun to your head because that's where you're seeing the movies. Right. It's not true. That's not true. It's not true. That's not true. You know what a wise guy told me? He said, let me tell you something. I'd rather go to a guy who's a guy and say I want a piece of his action than a straight guy. He goes, because I know a guy who's a guy, he's not going to go to the cops. Right. I could deal with him on my level. He said, but if I go to a guy and I know he's going to go to the FBI and he says no, I leave him alone. 100%. 100%. He, and he said, why? I said, why? He goes, because he's got the toughest mob in the world. That's right. The government's the toughest mob in the world. They print their own money and they won two world wars. That's right. Don't mess with them. I vouch for that 100%, yeah. no doubt. Yeah, no, man, that's what he said. But I do want to say this. I don't know if we spoke about it last time, but the movie of The Bronx Tale. Right. Coincidentally, you played a character by the name of Sonny. Yes. You didn't realize it probably back then, but you acted so much like my dad. I heard that many, many times. I mean it. And they that's asked why me if it was him. I'm well, I and said, I, said no. I, wonder, I said at that point, I wonder if Chaz knows my father because <clears throat> you carried yourself the way he, the words that you said, right. just everything about you in that movie reminded me so much of my dad. Yeah, I, I've heard that. And that's a, lot. a compliment because I love my dad. And I, I, yeah, I, uh, no, no. I, you know, it was, it was, it was Listen, great. Listen, to me, that's a big compliment because when people speak of your father, they speak of like, yeah. he was the tough guy. Yes. No, like no. some bosses are not tough guys. Like, uh, Castellano w wasn't really a tough guy. Castellano was like a, he was like a CEO. That's right. Getting off the side. But I want you to know that. Thank I mean, that's, you. That's Thank why you. I love that. And that's a, a yeah. real compliment. I, I take it, it as great. a real compliment. Castellano, he had the right idea. Yes. He really did. He wanted our life to be like a business. He didn't want thugs running around the street causing right. trouble and everything else. But I think he went about it the wrong way. He turned people off. And, uh, but he had the right idea. 
Because look, Chaz, you just can't go, you can't roam the streets being a, a, a crazy guy and robbing and st you just can't. It catches up with you at yes. some point in time. I mean, and look, Sammy Gravano did this. He made this separation, which I never really thought about it until he said it. And he said to me, you know, I'm more of a gangster. You're more of a, of a racketeer. Yes. And then he said, but I'm a gangster and a racketeer. He wanted to make sure he was both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I love the way he No, talks. but he was a gangster. He was a gangster. And you are a racketeer. A racketeer. And, and the life needs both. Yes. But what I said to him, I said, Sammy, I don't care what organization you have. I don't care whether it's the federal government, yeah. guys on the street, a business. Without money, you got nothing. Right. Without money to make these things work. And I said it a thousand times. You know who made the mob strong in this country? The government. During Prohibition. Right. They made millions during Prohibition. This is what financed the whole uh, organized crime. That's it correct. was the money they made through Prohibition. Right. You know, it's the same with, you know, these drug cartels. It's the money that makes them powerful. It's not the fact that they can go out and shoot people. Right. Because then you're just a bunch of thugs on the street, but you got nothing to finance yourself or do anything. It's all about the money. Without that, you, you don't have anything. And, and anything. And that's true of anything, anything in the world. No, you're right. Anything you're right. in the world. And sooner or later, you start killing so many people, the government's going to turn on you. The government. I mean, Pablo Escobar. You know, after a while, they just said, okay. Enough. Enough now. Yeah, and look at how much control he had within the government for a time. Well, but that's why he was around so long. Exactly, but then, uh, then after a while, it's, it's enough. Yeah, in Sicily too, when they killed uh, Totorino, yeah. when they killed him, you know, they just said, all right, that's enough, this guy's got to go. Once he killed Borsellino, mm -hmm. and, and then he killed uh, Giovanni Falcone, uh, uh, Falcon, that was it, they were done. They said, okay, and the people were done. They, they didn't care done. anymore. You know, they said, this guy, these people got to go. Well, you know, another interesting thing, people have said that the guys today in that life, or even in my era, they weren't like the old timers. The old timers were stand up guys. Right. And, and I said to them, let me explain something to you. Yes and no. And yes. I'm going to tell you why. Years ago, before they had the RICO Act and before they had the sentencing reform and the bail reform and Act and all of that, and all, before all of that, you get convicted of a crime, you get 10, 15 years, you still made parole, so you do six or seven, eight. Anybody could do that. Right. Any well, guy on the street can do that. I, I did eight years. Anybody can do that. Today, so guys stood up because right. it made sense for them to stood up. Right. Do a couple of years, come home. It's part of the life. Once the 80s came around, you get locked up, you get no bail. <laughs> right. No bail. You get, you get one count in a RICO count, you get 20 years. There's no more parole. You got to do 85% of your time. So you're doing 17 and a half. That's it. Wow. And normally, if you get 20, you're lucky because you got multiple counts. You're going away for 40, 50, 60 years. Not too many guys stand up on that. You can't stand up. And, and Chaz, the guys that were, were informing, they weren't young guys. They were old timers. Joey Messina was a boss of the Bonanno family. He was in his 60s when he turned because he got 300 years. <laughs> guys don't stand up under that. All the, yeah. Just the thought of that. The thought of it. So, you know, the government won. They created these laws that make it impossible to survive. So guys said, hey, and what did they come to you? They said, hey, don't worry about it. We got the witness protection program. We'll give you X amount of dollars. We'll change your identity, bring you out to another spot, live your life, and don't worry about it. Nobody's going to, because these guys are going away forever. How do you pass that up if you, you don't want to die in jail? You can't. There's not many people no. like Benny Eggs. No, really, so, yeah, right. so what happened in our life is there was a sense of fear at one time. You feared retaliation if you were to do something wrong. You feared right. the boss. Yeah, I know. But what happened was the fear of that life was transferred to the fear of the government. The government right. became more feared. Right. And then guys said, hey, what do I need this for? You know, for? that's a great point. So now what does that tell you? That tells you that fear of getting caught and going to jail works. Fear of getting killed works. So that's why, I, and I don't want to bring up today, but some of our laws today, you, 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 people are just robbing, stealing, and, and there is no crime. So how could you tell somebody they, they're not going to do it? In my neighborhood, Michael, I don't know if you knew Tammy Moriello. There was Tammy Moriello. Okay, uh, he owned the bar. and it was, it was Southern Boulevard. And the bar was the m 3 -M. My dad and my uncles would go there. And all these junkies, because dope was big then in the 60s, you know, heroin, they would steal the A-tracks out of the cars, break mm -hmm. the windows, -track, steal yeah. the A-tracks. I remember, right. they used to hang underneath the, used to the hang dashboard. Underneath, right. yeah. So the wise guys were getting pissed, their windows were getting broke. So what they did was, they grabbed these two 
one of the big dealers and junkies, and they grabbed him. They, put, they picked him up, threw him in a van. They took him for a ride. They said, okay, here's the deal. On this side of the street where the club is, you don't touch one car. On the other side where the Bronx Zoo is, you can steal all you want. If we find out that one of these cars got stolen, one of them got broken, we're coming after you. Even if you didn't do it, mm -hmm. we're coming to get you. And trust me, nobody will miss you. Do you understand? So those guys made sure. Nobody stole any cars. Nobody stole <laughs> ever again. Yeah. Nobody stole ever again. On this side of the street, they told them. Yeah. This is, on that side, they robbed. On this side, they, they didn't. Very know. effective. There was the Bruno, the Bruno brothers, a quick story. The Bruno brothers, had, there was a junkyard. These people owned it, really nice people. They ran out of business because people kept going in. Trip, you know, they went right through the alarm, robbed them. So this other guy takes over. He goes, no, no. He goes, I'm going to put alarm system. He goes, but I'm putting dogs in. He buys it. He puts dogs in. Big, you know, Rottweilers and stuff. Mm -hmm. He's there for a few months. Comes back one day. Three dogs dead. They shot him with bone arrows. Bone arrows? Bone arrows. Not even shoot. They didn't shoot him. They used like a crossbow or bone yeah. arrows. All three dogs had bone arrows in them. Mm. Dead, right? He sells it. He sells it to these wise guys, the Bruno brothers. They, everybody's telling them, don't buy this joint. It's a, it's, it's a money pit. They're going to rob you. They said, yeah, 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 yeah. They put a sign up in the junkyard from... I think it was like 20 feet by 8 feet. It says uh, on the sign, in the junkyard, big letters, anyone caught stealing in this yard will be beaten to death with a baseball <laughs> bat. The Bruno brothers. Right. No more crime. <laughs> Very effective. <laughs> no more. No alarm, no dogs, nothing. How is it? Will be beaten to death with a baseball bat. The Bruno brothers. That was it? They were there for years. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it works. <laughs> Sometimes it works. Let me ask you this. Brings up a, a, a good point. In, in the movie The Bronx Tale, yes. uh, you were asked, is it better to be feared or yeah, loved? Yes. What do you honestly feel about that? Well, I know what always, your response was. We always discuss it. Yes. And I know what you're saying. It's better to be loved than feared. I know what you're saying. And you're right. And I said this before when I spoke to you, that if you're a wise guy, it's better to be feared. Because, and that's only what Machiavelli would say. Machiavelli would say, if you're, if you're a boss, it's better that they fear you because he used to say, man is inherently evil and they will try to take over the boss. But if they fear you, they won't. Now, are you going to be losing love? Yes, of course you are. But that's the way he felt. And, and the wise guy once told me, he goes, I'd rather they fear me than they love me. I'll tell you what I think. I think years ago, yeah. that might have been, yes, in that life. Yes. But ever since the racketeering laws came in, and that fear is transferred to the government, right. like That's I said, point. I think, you know, you, you got a better shot if people love you and have a conscience about right. it and say, you know what, I can't hurt this guy. I can't I hurt I love him, guy. yeah. Yeah. What I wanted to ask you was, I always wanted to ask you this, is that I, like I just told you about the moment I met the wise guys and I said no. And I was ready to take a bullet in the head. I swear to God. I don't want to sound like a tough guy. I believe it. No, I believe it. But you know when you, you're really... Yes, passionate about Passionate. It. Yeah. Was there ever like a time where you went on a ride and said, I don't know if I'm coming out of this? Well, there was one meeting that I had. Right. That, um, yeah, I didn't think I was going to survive. I didn't know if I was going to survive. You know, one of the horrors of that life, Chaz, is that you make a mistake your best friend walks you into a room, you right. don't walk out again. And unfortunately, you know, as, as a capo in that life, you know, I, I obviously knew of those incidents. And so what happens, and I've said this before, so I can say it again. My dad was home on parole, calls me up, and he says, I got to see you. So I go to his house, and we're in the driveway of his house, and we're talking. He says, the boss wants to see us tonight. I said, okay, what time do you want me to pick you up? Because I would drive him everywhere. He was on parole. And we were both captains at that point. And he said, well, they want to do this differently. They want you to come in for, they want me to come in first, meaning him, and they want you to come in second. And I said, why? And I said, why do they want to separate us? Now, there was a lot of talk on the street. There was a, a, an article came out, I believe in Newsday, 
that said that I was making two billion dollars or something like that, and right. I was I was getting strong enough to start my own family. Wow, a total fictional story. Total lie. I had nothing to do with reality. It was nonsense, right? But guys, things get in their heads. Yes, you know, I, I don't have to tell you, it, it gets in their heads. So. I said, Dad, why are we going to let them separate us? No, we're going to go together. He said, no, 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 no. We got an order. That's how we're going to go. It was the first time I ever had an argument with my dad. I said, no, we're not doing it that way. We're doing it blah, 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 blah. I'm back and forth, back and forth. Finally, I threw up my hands and I said, you know what, Dad? I never disagreed with you. I said, I always listen to you. I said, I don't like it, but I'm going to do it your way. I leave. I get a call from this guy, Jimmy Angelina, another captain. He says, Michael, meet me in a certain place because the boss was on parole and we had to, you know, drive around so to make sure nobody followed us so he don't get violated. So I get in a car with him. I meet him in Brooklyn. I get in the car. I was in Long Island and uh, he's driving and somebody's sitting behind me, right? I recognize the guy, but I didn't know him well. Oh. And uh, we had about a, maybe a 15, 20 minute ride to the house in Brooklyn where we were going to meet everybody. Yeah. And uh, I'm waiting for Jimmy to tell me, you know, what this is all about. But he don't say anything. He starts talking to me about the Yankees. I love the Yankees, but I don't right. want to hear about the Yankees at night. And this guy ain't saying anything. I'm saying this, this doesn't feel good, right? Chaz, we get out of the car, maybe a 30-yard walk from the car to the basement apartment where we were going. And I get out of the car, and now I'm, my senses are keen. Right. And he gets out, and I... I suspect that Jimmy's walking behind me and the other guy's walking behind him. And I'm saying, this is, this is bad. I said, I, I don't like this, right? I, I can remember, when I talk about this, I remember it so vividly. It was an August night. I can remember the, the smell of the flowers and the crickets chirp because mm. I'm saying, I'm going to get killed here. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to walk out of this place. And so people have said to me, why didn't you cut and run? And I said, you know what? I don't know why. It was like yeah, it's too late. It was like robotic. I said, okay, yeah. what am I gonna do? This is it. It's like you know, you lose control. Someone said you, like you can't believe it. Yeah, you don't even. I didn't right. even know how to think. I can't even process how I was thinking. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know how I didn't. My knees were weak and my heart is thumping out of my chest. And I walked down those stairs. And when that door opened, you know, I know the setup. There's a guy and Set I said, with a gun, right? oh yeah, I said. This is, I, I don't know how I didn't faint when the door opened, but uh, obviously I'm here. Right. <laughs> so, but we sat down and they grilled me about money and this and that and that. And then what happened, I started to get mad because they would put me on a spot and I'm starting to get angry. And then I'm saying, wait a second, it looks like I'm going to walk out of here. Don't let me bury myself by right, getting mad right. at the boss. You don't do that. And so everything is done, right? And... Um, all right, let's have a glass of wine. Everybody's happy. And uh, I just wanted to get out of there. I was so aggravated. Yeah. Yeah. So I told Jim, I said, Jimmy, take me back to my car. I got a long ride. So we get in the car. Now, you got to listen to this. We get in the car, and I'm mad. Because I knew Jimmy my whole life. This guy's walking me into something, and maybe I don't know why. I said, he don't talk to me. He don't tell me anything. So I turn around to him, and I'm about to blast him verbally, right? And he says, wait a minute. Before you say anything, he says, I got to tell you something. I said, what? He said, you know, you held yourself up pretty good in there tonight. He said, this could have been a problem. Well, now I got even more mad. I said, you know that? You're my friend. I know you my whole life, and you don't tell me what's happening? So he looked at me, Chaz, I'll never forget. And he said, if it was the other way around, would you have told me? And he, hit, he knew exactly what to say. And I stood there for a second. I said, nope. He said, this is the life we lead, Mike. He says, you grew up in it. You know it as well as anybody. Wow. And it just, that night, that was a defining moment because it struck me too. And I said, wow. And then listen to this. I'm getting out of the car. And as I get out, he grabs my arm. And he says, I want to tell you something. He says, you're not going to like this, but you could take this to the bank. It's the truth, Mike. I said, what? He says, your father was in there before you tonight. He didn't help you one bit. And I was like stunned. I didn't, even, I didn't even know what to say to him. Right. I said, okay, and I get out. And as I'm walking back to my car, I'm saying, what can my father have done? And then I'm thinking, knowing him so well, he could have stood up for me and said, my son wouldn't rob, he wouldn't steal, he wouldn't do anything like that. Instead, what he said, because I heard afterwards, I don't know what my son is doing. Hey, he's a, I'm on parole, he does everything. I don't know what he's doing. He just kind of threw me under the bus. And you know what, Chaz? 
It was that night. I don't even know how I didn't make I guess I, I, I don't like to think about this, but right. it was that night that I said, what do we really got here? Father and son and this and I. It, it just, it was hurtful. It was more like do what you got to do. It was hurtful. Yeah. Wow. But, but that was a night where I was scared. I don't, I don't mind saying it. And I, it, it, wow. was, it, was, it was scary. But, so, but I, I said afterwards, you know, when I walked away from the life, I said, hey, I know I could face death. I did it once. So if somebody's right. going to come after me, I said, you know. Exactly. That's when you I face felt. it like that, you could say, you know what, I know I could, I could handle myself when, when, if the shit hits the fan. Yeah. It, 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 I learned a lot from myself that day when I did that. I said, you know what, I could face anything now. I'm okay. Because let me tell you something, you know, the wrong guy in there could have could have made it bad for you that night. Very bad. If somebody would have got insulted or, hey, you know. Who well, you I, I tried to make you where they couldn't. Yeah, the way you said them. it was right. I disarmed them right away. Yes. And then I got up. Because I knew the longer I stayed there, the worse it is. Exactly. And I got up and they must have just said, they never bothered me again. They must have said, you know what, fuck it, you know. Let them go. What money we're talking about. Maybe we're not yeah. talking about a lot. They should have realized. But, the <laughs> <laughs> no, but. Another just, mistake they made. <laughs> you know, they should have said, no, they never bothered me again, never asked me again. But I didn't go to that place, and I, just, and I avoided them like a plague. I avoided them, and they're all dead now anyway. So let me ask you this. You had, what were the defining moments in your life other than that one? Because the last time we spoke, Jazz, I mean, and I didn't even realize it, but so many people picked up on so many things that you said. Yeah. I said this earlier. And you know, we're, we're at a time now, I don't know if you feel the same, but I've never experienced this in my lifetime, yes. where there's so much division, right? so much hatred that's right out there. Right. Uh, people need encouragement. Uh, you know, I get asked all the time, you know, Michael, help me, I'm going through a, a litany of things. Yeah. And I think if we can provide something that's helpful to people, based upon experiences that we had in our life, that people really pick up on it, and they appreciate it. Yeah. More than you know, I've gotten so many comments about our sit-down that I don't get from others. Yes. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Just from some of the things that you said that encourage people, that help people, because of experiences that you had in your life. And well, I, I think one of the defining moments is when I got fired from that job that everybody knows. You know, I was, I was working at a doorman and I got fired. I didn't have money in the bank. I, I ran out of the money that I got from guest star roles that I did, and I just, well, I, that was definitely a big moment. I, I got fired, I went home, and I sat at the edge of my bed, and I, I'd say, and everybody knows the story, that was the saddest thing in life is wasted talent, was the card my father gave me, and I, and I said, I'm not going down, I'm not going down. I said, if they won't give me a part, I'll write one myself. And I went to the drugstore, I got five tabs of yellow paper, and I started, I said, what, what should I write about? I said, I'll write about the wise guys. I said, I know them. I said, I know when I, I remember the killing when I was nine years old, I saw it. And I said, I'll write about that. And I started to write and I performed it for my theater workshop. And I was like, each, each day I would write eight hours, 10 hours a day, every day. And then I would perform it on Monday night. Each week, then I would take eight minutes out of that, cut out three minutes. Each, I kept working it every Monday and I would edit, edit, until I had 90 minutes of a one-man show. And then I was able to get, raise the money and put it up. But it was that moment I just said, I'm not going down. I'm not going down. I'm not going to be a failure. I looked at that card and I said, I'm going to do something with my life. It's like, you know, I always say, it's forward motion. I say this on my podcast all the time to people. Forward motion. A bad decision sometimes is better than no decision. But you got to get out of the predicament you're in. If you want to change your life, you have to change. <laughs> it's so stupid, but it's so true. Unless you change, you won't change your life. I hate these people that they're with the same person for 10 years and they go, well, I, I, I got to change. I go, you're with the same person. You guys, you're not meant to be together. You're married to this guy, get out. Or you're married to this girl, get out. Or I, I hate my job, I hate my job. If you hate it that much, do something. Really do something. But it takes, a, you have to turn up the volume in your life. To be a success in, this, in life, you have to turn up the volume. You have to be willing to do more than anybody else is doing. And then 
you'll get notice. You have to show up. You know, one thing you said last time that really resonated with people is that, and it was a brilliant line, it's a brilliant way to look at life, Jazz. And, and I, I have that same feeling. You know, you want everybody to do good. Yes. You know, I, I, think, I think one problem that Italians have, and maybe you'll oh, disagree. Oh, yeah. Is, is he Italian? You know, I understand jealousy, envy may be a little bit more serious, right. but I understand jealousy. Sometimes you look at somebody and say, you know, geez, I wish I had that house. I wish I had yeah. that car. I wish I... Nothing wrong with that. We're human. Yeah. We're natural. But the problem that I've seen with a lot of Italians, and maybe I'm keying in on Italians because that's who I yeah. am, and, and especially in my former life, you know, they'll say, I wish I had that, and I don't want him to have it. Exactly. That's, that's the, the bad part. That's the bad part. Because that's like really mean, you know. Yeah, sometimes Italians could be like, like crabs in a bucket. When one crab goes up, they, they grab them. Yeah, and pull like, them back down. They pull yeah. them back down again. But what you said is, is, is just a great way to look at life. I want everybody to succeed. Let everybody be everybody. happy. Let everybody, I want everybody, everybody, to let everybody. Be happy. It's the way to be. Because your success doesn't diminish me. In fact, it only enhances me. And so if I want somebody else to be successful, then when he gets a moment, he'll help me. And even if he doesn't, the world will help me. Exactly. Because of my, because of my spirituality, I'm open. It's like a guy who, it's like a guy who's, uh, who can't find a girlfriend. He can't, he's trying to, he can't meet a girl that he likes, or a girl who can't meet a guy that she likes. As soon as they meet somebody they love, everybody wants to go out with them. That's right. That's right. Everybody. As That's soon true. as they make a commitment that I'm with one person, and why is that? People go, why is that? It's because they can see their happiness mm -hmm. and see their vibe. Right. And see how happy they are. And people go, I want that. I want to be with that. That person, I want to get to know. You know, sometimes people are mad or envious of people that are successful. And right. I say to myself, like now, oh, he's a billionaire. Well, the, the billionaire is the guy that's putting people to work, creating product, doing right. things to make, you know, to, to uplift people. What are you mad at them for? I don't right. get it. You want to be around somebody that has nothing, that's right. struggling, that can't do a thing for you? Or you want to be some, around people that can do something, you know, and give back and make life easier for yes. people? Yes. You know, but people don't, they don't get it. Like now we have a lot of, there's, there's, a, there's an animosity towards people that are successful, and I don't get it. It's yeah. not unsuccessful people that make the world go around. It's people that have success, that create things, that, that put people to work, that create products, yeah. that have an imagination. And, and uh, today, a lot of these people are demonized, and I don't get it. Well, the, you know, exactly. See, the problem, the way the world is, in my opinion right now, is, look, there's two forces. And I talk about this on my podcast. There's two forces in the world. That's what it comes down to. There's the positive force, and then there's the negative force. The problem is in the world, the negative force is stronger. Stronger, that's It's right. louder. Why? Because it's more organic, because it's here. It's in front of us. It's always here. We're all, the negative force is around all the time. Why are you parking there? Everybody's yelling at each other. That's the negative force. Only positive forces come, like now. Mm -hmm. When two positive forces get together, we, we're dealing with a positive force here. That's why your podcast and my podcast is, is so successful, especially yours, because we send it out there. They're up there. And positive people pick it up. But the negative forces in the world are louder. They're louder. So what I say for us, Michael Francis on his podcast, and Chaz Palminteri, we have to be louder. Mm -hmm. The negative forces are this loud, Positive forces have to get just as loud. But, the, but like I said, negative is stronger on Earth. Well, you know why? Another reason for that, Chaz. Positive people are out there doing positive things. They're not talking about it. They're not right. angry. The negative people, uh, they have nothing else to do. Right. They just want to be mad at everybody because they have nothing going on and they're envious. Exactly. It's harder to be positive than it is to be negative. It's, it's easy to be a failure. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to be a success because why? You have to work at it. Mm -hmm. You have to get up early and work at it. That's right. Negative, that's easy. Ah, I hate that guy. Oh, I don't want to be an ad, but that's why I tell actors and writers, you want to be you want to be in the arts? You want to be an actor? You want to be a writer? 
You want to be a producer? You want to be a director? Well, you better get out there. Yeah. It's easy to say, I hope that movie fails. I hope his podcast fails. I hope that script sucks. But you know what? We have to make the positive voices louder. You're and right. people, people who are failures, if they really want to do something, man, it shows up. You're right. It shows up. You know, that theory works a lot in, in life in a lot of different ways, too. Do you ever notice when there's one restaurant on a block, on a street, right. eh, maybe you go there. When there's 10 restaurants on that street, the crowds are coming because they're trying all different places. So sometimes that positive yes, competition is good. It's good. It brings people aboard. They want to come around. They want to see what's going on. Yeah. So you kind of share the wealth. So, you know, you talked about the Italian things. It's such, and I'm going to tell you this story. I, I take my family to, to uh, we go to Italy. And we're there. So I rent one of those big buses, those uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm telling only for, because the whole family's there, I have friends. We're in this Mercedes limo, like a big right. bus. Really yeah. nice. Yeah. And, we, and we go to Naples. We're in Tuscany. I said, let's go to Naples with the bus. We go to Naples. I want to go to this place, Don Michelle's. Oh, oh, Don yeah. Michelle's, the great, right. yeah, I hear my son say, no, no. <laughs> so we're going to Don Michelle's, the great, it's supposed to be the greatest pizza in the world right. in Naples. Yeah, we, 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 I went there. You went there, okay. So I won't ask you how the pizza is, but it's supposed to be... Well, I'm going to tell you my story. It's crazy, buddy. Okay. So I go there. We pull up. I'm so excited. And it says, close for all three. <laughs> it was in August. And they close in August. You know, the Italians, yeah. they close. Right across the street, there's this other place. I forgot the name of it. It was on the corner. It was on the corner. I walk in there, and they see it's, it's now 2 o'clock. I walk in there and I see all the people I get out of the thing, people are making it. Oh, yeah, that's just about there. The waiters are coming over. Oh, my God, complimente, complimente. They're being so nice to me. Come in, come in. So I said, yeah, I got my family. I figured it's across the street from Dalma Show. It's got to be good. I'm right. in Naples, right? The Italian made a day. For some reason, he walks over to me and goes, eh, Mr. Palmentari, you know. He goes, we close at 2. Well, they close at 2, then they open again up at 5. Oh. You know, in Italy, they take the CS. Yes, yes. Right? He goes, uh, he goes he's going like this with his watch. We close. And, and, the, and the, the chef is right there. And he goes, he goes, uh, he goes I forgot the guy's name. He goes, oh, no, I'll, I'll open. They shut the oven. He goes, oh, I'll, I'll take care. The waiters are going, yeah, we want to. He goes, hey, 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 hey. Mr. Palmateri, you know, he's being an asshole. He's being an Jesus. asshole. But I respected it. I said, not a problem. We're, we're good. We're good. I turned. I said, look, I'll find, I'm in Naples. We'll find another place, right? I'm walking off. He goes, Mr. Palmateri, he goes, would you mind, listen to balls on this guy, Tanya. Would you mind taking a picture with me and, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so, to, so to I turned to him and I go, oh, you want a photo? Yeah, yeah. On my mother father, I did this. I went, you want a photo? I went. I said, I'm closed. I open up again at 5. Come back at 5. Find me at 5, and I'll be glad to do it. I get in the thing. Right, I go to this other place. We have a tremendous meal. The guy sees me. Come in. Oh, my God, I love you. You know, treating me and my family like amazing. And believe me, I don't want it for free. I want to pay. I don't, I don't want nothing for free. He treated us so in incredible. The food was amazing. Didn't charge us. Mm -hmm. I saw I left a lot for the waiters and right. everybody. You know, you got to do that. Of course. So now we're on our way back to Tuscany, and my wife was saying, I told my wife, I go, you know, that guy's got some nerve. So I, just, uh, I said, you know what? How stupid was that? Uh, it's so stupid. Now I'm raving about this restaurant that I went to right. all over Twitter, all over Instagram, all over Facebook. Of course. And the other guy I put went to the... And I did it. It was a street thing. I, I can't help. Yeah, he deserved it. And I, he deserved it. And I said, went to this place. I think it was named. No, I, no. Oh, John, I stop it. <laughs> My wife goes, stop. It was called Angelina, something like that. And I said, nope. pizza sucked. Place was dirty. <laughs> <laughs> right? Hey, he deserved it. Right? I'm sorry. And then I write. A, I wait. I wait a few days. I write another one. Never go to this place. <laughs> bing, bing, bing. I'm Twitter. Right? Finally, I get a call. I get a. I get a tweet back. From the guy's son, he tweets me back. He goes, he goes, yeah, a real tough guy when you're in America now. Mm. So he goes, why don't you come in here and say it to my face? Now I'm back home. So I tweet back. I tweet back to him. I go, 
No problem. I said, I will meet you, but first let's meet, let's meet at the, the Angelina. Angelina's. <laughs> let's, I go, no, let's meet at Don Michelle's. Uh -huh. I go, let's meet at Don Michelle's so I can get a great slice of pizza yeah. before I kick your ass. <laughs> And now, now it's like a Twitter war. Back People are joining in. Oh, it's like That's insane. Funny. And he's, he realized he had to stop. Because yeah. I was killing this guy. But I, I'm only saying the story because give you an example that all he had to do was be a nice so guy. So stupid, yeah. Stupid. I would have ate, I would have left, and I would have raved about the place. Well, see, we both had a bad shot there because we go to Don Michelli's. Right. And I get there, I'm not kidding, there's a hundred people outside waiting in yeah. line at night. Wow. I says, Cam, I ain't waiting in this line, I don't care how good the pizza is. Yeah. So it just so happens, somebody spots us from that knew us from somewhere, I don't yeah. know. And they got a, a, a number all the way up front. Right. But it still wasn't enough. I said, Cam, let's go to the restaurant on the corner there, right? right. So we go across, we eat over there. The same place. Yeah, same, same place, place, same really? exact place. and. Now we go back and we get the pizza, but we're bringing it home from right. Don Michelli's, yeah. right? My lane. So we're bringing it, we're in the car. Uh, we didn't eat it yet. I don't exactly. We get back to the hotel. I reach in my pocket for my passport. I get mine. I had hers. It isn't there. I said, Cam, where's your passport, right? I don't know. What happens is when I paid the bill in the other restaurant, right. the guy that gave you a hard time, I dropped a passport on the floor. Oh, God. Now, I didn't know that, but I'm saying, what right. do I do? So I'm thinking. So now I call this guy that we met who was staying in a hotel close by. I said, go over there and make sure they got my passport. He goes and gets the passport. He finds it for me. Thank God. I said, otherwise, you're not going home. Yeah, We're staying. Home. We're not exactly. going anywhere. The bottom line is I never got to taste Don Michelli's pizza. Oh. <laughs> I still Because they ate it. Yeah, I, I didn't they, get to I taste, didn't it. taste it. Next time we got maybe we'll go together. We'll go together. We'll go together. Yeah. But they got one in L.A. now, right, Cam? Amazing. Yes, they Yeah, they, we went there one night. It was, it was good? Yeah, it was very good. It was excellent. It's incredible. Yeah. Really? It's yeah, really, really good. Hollywood. Really good. So well, I always tell people, you come to New York, you go to my restaurant in Manhattan. We don't have pizza, but my, but my Chas Palmetary in White Plains, we got great pizza. Yeah, but the great food was, was great that Thank night. You. Excellent that night. Chas Palmetary's restaurant, again in New York, you got to visit. 30, yeah, 30 West 46th Street yes. at 264 Main Street in White Plains. The best. And I'm not just saying that because he's here. If I didn't like it, I wouldn't say anything. The food was terrific. That's right. Absolutely but terrific. But always said, if you got nothing nice to say, you keep don't your say mouth it. shut. Yes. Let me ask you this, too, because you said some things that kind of really hit a chord with me. Determination and passion. Yes like anything else in life, is critical in your industry. Yes. Without it, you're not going anywhere. Without, it, without, without determination and passion in life, I don't think you're going anywhere. And I know you talk about this to all, you know, about success and about being a CEO. What, that's why you, that's what, what makes a CEO? And I believe what made you successful as a racketeer is the same thing that made you, is going to make you, made you successful is doing this. The same thing. Think about that. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't change your... What you were doing was wrong, okay? But as far as the way you handle things, you deal with people, you talk to people. What, what, is, what is a, a, a person successful do? A CEO, they inspire other people. They mm -hmm. bring respect. People want to be with you. They want to help you. And so I believe somebody, the way you talk to people and the way you inspire... You, you galvanize people. You say, that's a great idea. That's, you know, even if it's not your idea, you make them think it's their idea. Mm -hmm. That inspires them. That makes them want to do more. Well, you know, I, I, yeah, and I agree with you with all of that. And, you know, what, what I say to people all the time, you can be a boss, right. but not necessarily be a leader. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. you're only a leader when people want to follow you. Right and you carry yourself. Now, right. you could be a boss and order people around and that's your position, but it doesn't mean you're a leader. A boss and a leader could be two separate and distinct things. Now, you could be both. You could be a leader and a boss, right. both, but not necessarily be a boss and be a leader because I say that a leader is somebody that you want to follow. He inspires you. He yes. motivates you or she. They inspire you and motivate you, and I think you have that quality. Uh, well, I, I try I mean to. I, I try to when I'm directing a movie. I, or when I speak to, uh, I do a lecture at a, at a college, mm -hmm. 
uh, for the arts, for acting, or writing, or directing. And the things that I say on my podcast, I say right, I, I tell them in person. I tell them 80, 85% of life is just showing up. Mm-hmm. When you feel like you don't want to do it, just get out of bed and do it. Just like working out. Working out is showing up. Absolutely. You complain, you're, not, you're heavy, you're not feeling well. Get up, get up out of bed and do it. Well, I want to wrap it up with this, Chaz. This, uh, I got to tell you, my favorite guy to sit down with. I, I really mean that because so much good comes out of it. Aside from the information you provide, it's just uh, people get encouraged by what you have to say. The Chaz Palmitary Show, that's all I got to do is go to that and uh, go on chazpalmitary.net. And I'm doing my one-man show uh, all across uh, uh, the United States. Well, when you when you get the schedule, give it to me because I want to post it too so that Great. anybody that wants to see it, they can go out and see it. Really? We'll post all about your podcast. We'll jump yes. on. Yes. And after this, we're not in New York, so I can't take you to Chaz Palmateri's restaurant, but I'm going to take you. We're going to eat some good Italian food Fantastic. tonight. Fantastic. Anyway. I'm looking forward to it, Mike. All right? Thank you. All right, brother. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.